Hey guys, so one of my videos on microservices appeared on another site, to my surprise, um, called Coding Tech. At first I was like, what's going on here? This, they've ripped me off. Um, I have liberally uh, licensed the video, so you know you could download and republish it and I don't know, mash, mash my face up with something weird. You're welcome to, I don't really care. Uh, I, I license all my co content pretty liberally. So, um, but this coding tech, they didn't tell me that they did this. A guy named Rihan on the AWS uh, Slack user group thing told me, so cool. At, at first I was a bit upset, but then um, I did notice that they, they updated um, the description with the link back to the video. So, um, okay, they comply. And, and I, to be honest, I just, the reason why I make videos is, is, is the comments, right? And there was like 200 new comments to this video, um, 40,000, uh, I mean, almost 50,000 views compared to the 6,000 on my own channel. I mean, what's going on with my channel, guys? Get, start spreading the, the gospel. I use this excuse to have some fun and I had to have a Zoom call with uh, Rehan and go through the comments together because he also interestingly has written like a cool decision chart and uh, blog. I mean, he's he's very much on top of microservices um, and it was great to, to chat with him about the comments. Unfortunately, I when we did the Zoom call, I didn't optimize for third party video recording. So you'll get like a tiny picture of my face and his in, in, in the top corner there. Sorry about that. Um, please forgive me. Enjoy the, our talk, I guess, um, you know, just listen to us perhaps without watching the video because the video just exposes my, my, uh, my soul on the right there with all the video suggestions. So, hmm. so th there you go. <laughs> Do you think the team size matters? Well, I would definitely not consider it when you are a small team, because you because you will have all of this kind of overhead of, of like keeping track of um, like what's the communication between these services, the like the data going, like where do I need to look for the logs for the service. So I would definitely not do it for a small team, but for a large team, like it can go either way like the communication is key like if you do have these multiple backend teams working on services um just don't be one team like working on everything because then kind of defeats the purpose you can just as well probably build something on it and that is a monolith and that does the exact same thing but if you're doing these microservices you have to do proper communication between the team and follow processes like don't break contracts and um, yeah. do versioning and all those kind of stuff. So you have to have really high discipline if you really want to do this. I find really... it very weird. People just say like, oh, monolith, you can't scale. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so Are you crazy? You can still... <laughs> so like, yeah. you can still do it, you, um, like the like decoupled services or decoupled components within your monolith. Um, and then you can scale those parts separately from like the rest of your monolith um, but it's still a monolith and like that part can scale differently from like the rest and it, you know, it's still very very much you know scalable and resilient so definitely possible i've done it like the most of the times like i wouldn't reach for a microservice unless there's a very very good reason do you understand what this comment is it's for a mega star report no idea. Oh, I, don't know what the... I know what it is. I know what it is. Have you, have you seen Kazan TV or something? We're blocked. We can't get... uh, they call it like a service team, and they yes, yes. and, the, uh, and, the, and then as I mentioned, they they generate their their schema, the API, whatever uh, definition. And for the most part, probably the the front end is is you know what do you call it? Bootstrapped, scaffolded to to you know to some extent already right they don't even need a front-end team it's like they're uh like 80 percent there already off the bat so it is. if we're thinking if we if we compare to aws which i think we should because it's the only it's the only place i, I think that does it right <laughs> aws team um dynamics are like uh one per service 
I mean, this this guy at worst, a hundred and two hundred milliseconds. I I mean, he's in the right ballpark. Like I used to work at Gojek, and the cutoff point for the API was one hundred and fifteen milliseconds. And then we had to fall back to a different system. So I um, saw something that they didn't even have timeouts on on the HTTP libraries that were making um, calls to the other services. All right. So there's one service which is a little bit slow, or, or like it might have been down, but then it just hangs, and then everything just like cascades downwards and fails. Um, so you know, like if you monitor it like that by saying at worst two, like 200, 200 milliseconds, that's Probably a good thing to do to, to yeah. prevent that. Yeah, if you were take if you were going to do microservices, like I would say, I mean, if you got, if you really were going to do it, you would have to set like a uh, like a, uh, a a hard limit, like mm -hmm. one fifty, like one fifty milliseconds, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, max timeout, max timeout, oh yeah, whatever, just timeout. But no one does that. No one does that. Seriously, except in like very the, the exceptions, basically. Have you have you seen? Okay, that's a good question. Have you seen Microsoft's actually shine? Well, on the amount of projects that I've worked, I've I I haven't really. Um, <laughs> I've seen microservices being done incorrectly a lot of times, but I haven't really seen one that could have been done better by just like doing a, a monitor and coordinating everything that would be the same thing. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Okay, you don't want multiple connections to database. I agree that I shouldn't have probably said that. I should not. I, I get a lot of flack for this one. <laughs> um, I shouldn't have said that, but I've seen this. I've honestly fucking seen this. I know mm. it's it's definitely like the, like a, what do you call it? A red flag. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that um, like many years ago, like um, like when I just started out of serverless like five years ago, back when there was still not a lot of information on this. And yeah, then for the MySQL database, all these lambdas speaking to it and just like hammering it, like closing up, like closing connections and opening it. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. The the fact that yeah, just just not using uh, what do you call it a resource pool is a is a huge problem mm -hmm. with um, MySQL. Uh, yeah, you can't tear up and tear down connections. It doesn't work. So um, it's easy to have your own database if you're doing serverless because your database is probably um, paid like per usage. And, and like it isn't like an, an RDS or a Postgres database that you just have to have for this one service. And when there isn't usage, then you pay a lot for it. And having a database that can scale up and down is very nice. And that's what makes serverless so uh, attractive to microservices in my opinion but unfortunately the only real um database in serverless is DynamoDB. i think there isn't really good relational solutions right i mean i've so never there is that aurora postgres and, and mysql but that really doesn't solve the problems for me um, if it's not really serverless <laughs> Right, you still pay the scaling points that still don't work correctly, and then you stay on that amount of um, resources for a while. And but the database is, is asking for more, but the query is also running, so you can't scale up to the new resource point. So there's lots of other like mm. gotchas in there. Yeah, there's a whole lot of gotchas. I think the I think I was I was on Hacker News like a year ago. People were talking about using SQL Lite in an S3 or something. I thought that that might be more workable, but like, how do you manage the rights? Probably not very well. Mm -hmm. But like, uh, but it's fair to say that DynamoDB is the only workable solution right now. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. from from a from a what do you call it? From a pragmatic point of view, I'd say, like I mm -hmm. know people who work basically on Chrome. I mean, it's a monolith for Christ's sake. They have hundreds of developers and they are pumping in features and making code changes like crazy. So I don't really buy this. I, I It just doesn't make sense to me. It's like a, a well-structured monolithic app. Having hundreds of developers, even if I had a hundred developers, doesn't make, make it uh, hard to deliver a feature. It's management and processes that um, actually hinder you to, to, to do this. And 
if you don't get it right in the beginning, it's probably hard to iterate on that. Yeah. And that's probably what they're seeing. Yeah, so step functions is basically an event orchestrator that I like to use within a service. Um, I'm like where this um, step function knows about everything that's going on in the service, who to call, what to call. But as soon as I throw um, events to other services, then I just publish them onto the um. event bus and to other services to consume. Like they don't have intimate knowledge about what's going on in my service. I, I guess, I mean, I'm just playing back what I think I understand is that I, it's also a fear that I have is like, if you don't, if you don't put everything into step functions, it doesn't make sense because the, if you're calling mm -hmm. other services or something like that, or other things, then there's no value in step functions. You might as well just keep to your event bridge and the way you do things normally. Right. Because you, because you wouldn't have the visibility in step functions anyway. Right. Is that, did I understand it right? Well, that's, yeah, well, that's why, like, many times I just implement something in code. Like, I would just do Lambda function, a queue, a Lambda function, and then store the data in, I mean, in a database because I don't need a step function there. It's a very simplistic, um, like, workflow that isn't going to change. Like, nobody else needs that a bit. So then I just mm. do that within, the, within my... What do you call it? A sadistic yeah. workflow? Painful. Um, no. <laughs> Did you say sadistic? I didn't, but <laughs> okay, go um, ahead. It almost fits, I guess, depending on like what your stance is towards that. Yeah, I don't. That's that's something that's absolutely key for me is is development workflow and, um, like number one, one of the number, four, yeah, I guess it is a number one rule for me is that I want it to run locally. So the minute like I'm I'm having to invest time into a cloud only AWS only step function language or cloud formation, even almost, it does feel a bit daft because, because yeah, I can't run it locally. Like the cool thing about all my little Lambda things is that I can run it locally and test things to some extent. Okay. Dynamo DB makes it a little bit exciting, but you know, I can get by. I don't know. I, I don't have a good solution for queues. Do you, do you ever somehow simulate queues locally? I don't actually uh, or like SQL, SQS more specifically. Mm. Like I don't like simulate the transfer, but, but I do simulate um like almost in a unit test kind of sense where I simulate just the input coming from um SQS and and then I just pass that to my Lambda function and still debug it and make sure everything works. Okay, so, so you, do you, you, you like you, you just you just you just abstract on the event, right? You you just use the event. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah I'd, I, I'm, yeah. So, would you actually use step functions, or would you um, avoid it as a rule? No, um, I would use it, but um, not in a lot of cases. Um, so, like I've used one like where it makes sense. Where I wanted a um, certificate from ACM, um, which is Amazon's certificate manager. But like, I want to request it. Um, and you then put your DNS records, it takes some time for um, that validation to take place. And there's no event that notifies you. So there I created a step function that just creates the ACM and then puts DNS records and then just every minute checks, okay, is it valid? Is it valid? And once it's valid, then it posts a different event that says, okay, it's now valid. So in, in that case, um, it's much easier to do with the step function than to what I've been doing that with two lambdas storing some state somewhere or which i didn't really care about in, in that case state function was perfect what why was it easier because uh you had like a point and click interface i don't actually understand why was it easier because otherwise i would have had to store some state somewhere else so, um, like in a database to say that um oh. like this oh. lambda function must check this this certificate but with the state function it's nice because when it started, um, I told it what um, certificate to check. And then every time, um, like that Lambda file check it in, and when it starts back up, it, it, um, like it has that information. It has a counter it. and all that other stuff, all that state. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, le I think I learned something today. People sometimes think that they're going to be free to do what they want to do at microservices. I don't think that's true because you have to have a lot of discipline.
with the APIs and uh, okay, maybe you can choose your language. Like, well done, you can choose your fucking language. Awesome, but maybe you should be using the right language to begin with or something like that. I don't know. It's like, um, I'm like within a smaller team or a company to use different languages, for different services. That's just something that's waiting to fail. Like where this one company has um, each service in, in, in a different language. That's just horrible. I wouldn't want to work there. If someone told me at my workplace, oh, we're going to start a new critical microservice and I want to, I want to write it in Rust. I mean, I'm going to be that old guy going, oh my God. <laughs> well, we, have know, to, we, have, we have to stop these guys right now. <laughs> But like my problem comes in like um, like when that developer leaves or maybe two of them leave at the same time and then HR comes up with this massive spec of this one guy being able to do Rust, Go, Node, C Sharp and oh, yeah. all kinds of languages. And uh, yeah, then it's just hard to find more people to be able to work on that. <laughs> what, what I find extraordinary to me uh, as, a, as an old, I mean, I'm not that old, but like I know JavaScript uh, just because I've just had years of experience of it. And then like Node.js is considered very cool and you get some hipster programmers and then you look at the code and um, it's just a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. And uh, all these dependencies and uh, I mean, I'm not against Node actually. I'm, I'm not terribly against Node, but when you, but when you write Node in a, a very... Yeah, it's a real can be a real like like Java is actually better in some regards because there's a lot more what do you call it guardrails. Oh well. Yeah, and it like forces syntax and and type yeah. of like port pattern and stuff. But same with PHP, like you can do terrible stuff with PHP, but you can also build quite reasonably good software with it. <laughs> but mm. it's because it's so easy to start with and do something that people can do the wrong thing. Yeah, I I really like Go because I think. I think it's hard to fuck up Go. I think it's hard. I mean, you, I've seen bad code, but like it's like refactoring Go is sweet joy. Like you, the, it's like, you know, the IDE is very aware of everything and you can just clean things up pretty quickly. One thing that always blew my mind is that I was very arduous about documentation of APIs, right? Putting it in Postman, publishing it. Uh, you know, you can even put the swagger in in the in the api gateway and then you can like publish some um uh, things like this but over doing after doing this for some years i've actually come mm -hmm. to the stone cold realization no one ever looks at the swagger at the end of the day they just want you to give them a curl command and be done with it like just run the curl command in the cli send it to them and then they'll implement it they'll never read the swagger so I actually got to the point, like if my, I, I just don't even bother. I just, I just, I just come up with a few curl examples and I send it to them and I'm like done because I know that's going to work. The swagger thing doesn't work. Anyway, that's just so my, that's doing, just, that's anecdotal evidence. I'm doing something now like where I like write a very, a very detailed an open API spec or, or a swagger and then yeah. I generate an, an SDK from that and then I give them the SDK. So they don't even know there's API behind it. And they have to put in the API URL, um, like get the like authorization headers to put in there, like when they create that class that um, for that service and that's it. So I'm like taking that approach that um, AWS is doing where you basically just have this SDK and that's how you um, you generate an SDK? That. How the hell do you do that? So um, the Swagger is there for them to use if they wanted to, but there's an SDK that they can just consume. And there's tons of libraries that can convert a, a, a like very well-written open API spec into an SDK of like any language. So it's, which are, and that's also cool. Like you can just um, give this program that, that Swagger file and then they can integrate with any kinds of SDK or like any language that they want to. That's interesting. I mean, are you dealing, I'm just trying to think, is your audience a higher bar or a lower bar than mine? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, this is actually internally just for the front end. Like I would write my back end, a, a, a very detailed Swagger file. And then whenever that changes, it publishes um, 
and it publishes that HTK into a GitHub, and then the front end just reads from that GitHub. It, I mean, it, it doesn't even go to NPM. You can install directly from GitHub. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Abby, if you, if you could give me an example of that, I'd be very curious. This is blowing my mind, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I still want to do a write up sometime. So. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Do check out Rayhan's blog and subscribe to him on Twitter too, why don't you? And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Like the video, subscribe, tell people about my awesome channel. And uh, oh man, it's good to be back after having COVID. Phew. Toodle pip.